is Isabel Ender from the Manta Trust and Andy Cornish from WWF, who will be presenting uh, on the best practices. So we will get started with today's session. Uh, I'd just like to remind you all there is a questions box. If you'd like to write down your questions in the questions box and during the Q&A after the presentation, each presentation will take about 20 minutes. Um, we will send you a link with the PowerPoints after uh, the, the webinar session and the recording of the webinar. So if, you, if there, there is information that you want to take down during the webinar and have missed, you'll have an opportunity to do that later. Um, and we will have a Q&A after each presentation. So do uh, write down your questions as they're presenting and then I will, uh, I will uh, pose them to the, the presenters after their presentation. So shall, we'll get started. Uh, let me just introduce everybody to Andy Cornish. Um, Dr. Andy Cornish leads the WWF's uh, work in, uh, in the, on this project. Um, he's a marine ecologist by training um, and a leader of, uh, of the WWF and Traffic Shark and, Shark and Ray Initiative called Restoring the Balance, which works to improve management, reduce unsustainable consumption, and improve the sustainability of trade in shark and ray products in 13 countries. He's a very keen diver and based in Hong Kong. So um, with that introduction, Andy, would you like to start your presentation, please? Thank you, Carol, and uh, thanks to uh, everybody who's able to join us. Um, so just to kick us off, this is uh, this, this project, which we're tentatively calling uh, Swimming with Sharks and Rays. This is a joint collaboration between WWF, Manta Trust, and Project Aware. Um, and as you heard, I'm joined by uh, Isabel Enders of the Manta Trust, and we also have on the call uh, jo Joanne Marston of Project Aware, who will also be available to uh, answer questions. Uh, this is actually the first time that we've talked about the guide to an external audience, uh, so this is something of a soft launch for us. Bit of background to kick us off. So um, I'm sure some, some of you are aware of this research. So globally, around 590,000 shark watchers generating around 314 US um, million dollars per year and supporting around 10,000 direct jobs. So, um, in terms of actually the numbers uh, of operations out there, there was a 2011 study that did inter internet research um, and documented nearly 400 uh, well-established shark operations in uh, 83 locations in 29 of the countries. Uh, most of the locations at that time were in Oceania, followed by the Greater Caribbean, uh, North America, Latin America, Southeastern Africa, and Asia. Most of the operators are focusing on around uh, 25 species of sharks and rays, and unsurprisingly, the more shallow water charismatic species. Um, and at that time, uh, whale sharks uh, were the most popular species. So, shark tourism is certainly growing. I gave you that figure a little, a little while earlier from a separate study. Uh, nearly 600,000 shark watchers, 10,000 direct jobs. Uh, and most importantly, it's estimated that over the next 20 years, um, the numbers of shark watchers could double globally um, and generate more than double uh, the expenditure. Uh, separate to that study, uh, a, looking just at the manta ray tourism, um, annually found around a figure of around um, $140 million. So these, are, these are already quite substantial uh, activities um, and growing. And just to give you a comparison um, against the 700 million, 780 million figure, um, the landed value of global shark fisheries um, in 2009 was about $630 million. Um, it's been in decline for the past decade. So it's actually possible uh, that in the next 10, 20 years, then the amount of uh, revenue being generated from the catches of sharks and rays could actually be exceeded by that generated from tourism. Uh, this comes at a time when the plight of sharks is worse than ever. Um, of the th uh, around 1,040 odd species of sharks and rays, there's been enough data to assess the threat of extinction of over half of them, and of that, one third are found to be threatened with extinction. And the main cause um, of population declines is, of course, overfishing, although there are other threats, um, habitat 
uh, modification and different threats to it, to freshwater species. So shark tourism offers a compelling alternative to fishing sharks in terms of income, livelihoods and sustainable utilization. Um, however, there are problematic practices existing, including overcrowding, uh, impacts to the natural behavior and health of the animals from provisioning, conflicts between fishers and tourism activities, um, and uh, good practices being watered down over time. So as a result of this, um, we're not really, shark, shark and ray tourism is not really um, offering as much of the win-win solutions um, as we might desire to the detriment of the animals, the operators, and the communities. This is not really surprising because many operations are homegrown and advice on how to conduct best practice has not readily been available um, between beyond codes of conduct for some species such as whale sharks and manta rays. So this really was the impetus uh, for WF Manta Trust and Project Aware to come together to create the best practice guide. Uh, it's taken more than a year for us to get to this stage. Um, and we've been advised, been advised by a technical advisory group um, of expert scientists uh, in the various fields covered in the guides. Um, and we're also taking input um, from an industry advise, advisory group, um, which primarily consists of um, shark and ray focused dive operators. In terms of the structure of the guide, there are essentially two sections. Um, there is a, there's a narrative section, if you like, how to use the guide, uh, being a best practice operator, um, a separate section for those new operators, um, and a general section on understanding impacts, research, review, and monitoring. Um, and the second major part of the, uh, the guide is a toolkit. We understand um, that um, you know, many, many uh, tourism operators are fairly small operations, um, they're extremely busy, um, and they don't have a lot of time to spend um, you know, reading long manuals, so the, the, uh, the tools are very much intended to make, uh, make this process of achieving best practice um, as straightforward as possible. We also uh, feature case studies, so real life case studies um, from different parts of the world um, featuring different aspects of best practice. So in terms of the different aspects that comprise um, best practice for a shark and ray tourism operation, uh, it's essentially about achieving financial profitability while proactively embedding environmental sustainability and social responsibility into the business. So for shark and ray tourism operators, this means having a business model that includes operating profitably and safely, minimizing impacts on target species, nurturing a culture of continuous improvement and compliance, um, and being accepted by the local community. So in terms of, uh, just to give you a flavor um, for some of the different sections that are, uh, that are covered by the guide, um, in terms of guidance for existing operators, uh, one of the most important themes running through the guide is creating a culture of continuous improvement and compliance. Um, this relates to um, setting business core values, uh, investing, edu investing in education, um, and using a, a code of conduct. And this really uh, is reflected, you know, throughout throughout the business, um, from the, the the owner of the business um, all the way down to the staff uh, that are interacting um, with the visitors. Um, and absolutely key that these kind of values are continually reinforced. Uh, in terms of provisioning, which is a controversial practice as it can alter the animal's natural behavior, health, and even habitat um, in ways provisioning, just so that everybody is clear, is not just uh, the feeding of animals. It can include chumming, um, and it can include the use of bait, which may be uh, real or not, um, as well as uh, different 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 types of actual feeding of the animal on, the, on this diagram, um, the, those at the bottom have a greater degree of involvement with the animals. So the team very much looked at the science to guide the advice on this topic um, and advises that encounters should be conducted without any form of provisioning um, if possible 
it's best not to use one. Um, and we're really advising a precautionary approach um, to avoid unexpected, you know, and in many cases still unknown, ecological safety and economic um, impacts. Um, if provisioning uh, is occurring because there's no way that the uh, tourism operation could be conducted without provisioning, uh, we thoroughly recommend uh, developing a responsible provisioning plan um, and really minimizing, uh, really minimizing the impacts such as by limiting the amount and type of bait that an operator uses over time period um, or perhaps the numbers of operators um, allowed to provision sharks um, or rays. And it's very important to really keep up the latest research um, and I think the onus really is on the, uh, the operators that are conducting provisioning to ensure that they're conducting sufficient research um, on the impacts uh, to the animals um, and other kinds of impacts so that uh, any negative impacts from provisioning um, are kept to an absolute minimum. In terms of uh, building a social license to operate. Um, we're really talking here about investing in the local, investing in the local community. And essentially, there are three, cent three central components to social license. Um, so, in terms of legitimacy, stakeholder will want to believe that an operator's activities are legal and acceptable. Uh, in terms of credibility, operators need to really walk the talk and show that they're reliable and can keep their promises. Um, and trust. Um, various studies have shown that communities normally respond well when the operators do not take advantage of them um, and demonstrate integrity and competence uh, in managing the risk, risk that their op operation represents. And I think you know, we'd probably all be aware of examples out there where perhaps shark and ray tourism operations have not um, included the, uh, the degree of interaction or don't, don't operate with the de degree of positive interaction with the local communities. Um, that we might like to see um, and the guide really has some practical advice um, on how, how operators can earn the social license um, by building trusting relationships with stakeholders um, and benefit sharing. Um, understanding, the, understanding the local community and other stakeholders in terms of beliefs, customs and issues, and livelihoods um, is critically important. In terms of con continuous improvement, um, operators will need to have the information to hand um, in order to guide that continuous improvement. Uh, so regular reviews across key areas such as economic efficiencies, customer experience, safety, environmental sustainability and social responsibility um, are a great way to go about um, collecting that information in order to not only maintain standards um, but to guide improvement where necessary. Uh, moving on to new operators, um, unsurprisingly uh, one of the first things I need to do is understand the institutional requirements, so local, national and other legal and policy frameworks, understand the basic regulations that are in place and how tourism is managed and supported, um, licensing and permitting, um, and also of course local, atti local attitudes regarding ships, shark and ray tourism, which at the end of the day can be uh, just as important for operating a successful, well-managed business, and we have two tools uh, that are available to uh, to support operators um, to really guide them through. One of them, one of them is called at the moment rather long title of uh, how well do you know your market and institutional requirements, um, and the second one considerations for management improvement measures where needed. New operators, of course, need to think about choosing a site, um, and I think it's worth it's worth highlighting here that not all areas um, are going to be not not all areas of the ocean are going to be um, have the potential to support uh, dedicated shark and ray tourism operations. I mean, clearly, you're going to need to have a high probability of encountering target species. The site has to be fairly accessible. Um, the animals need to be fairly predictable. I mean, if they're not year, they're year round, they would need to be fairly predictable. And in terms of when, uh, when tourism operators can expect to, uh, to encounter these species. Um, and then there are obviously the practical considerations, you know, managing the costs 
accessibility, managing human safety and animal welfare risks, um, as well as, of course, costs and benefits to the local communities. Um, and in terms of, uh, very much from a conservation perspective, avoiding critical habitats, um, such as breeding, nursing, or pupping areas. And we have, a, again, we have a dedicated tool um, that can guide new operators through the, the thought process of thinking about selecting a site. So in terms of the toolkit itself, uh, there are uh, six tools in it. Um, I've mentioned uh, in previous slides um, where some of these tools really fit in. Um, and I'd just like to highlight two that we haven't talked about so far. Um, for number tool number one, how do you perform um, and the last tool. So how do you perform um, is a, uh, it's a flow chart that operators can work through um, and actually score themselves. Uh, against these different, uh, against these different, against the, sorry, against the different questions that are asked, and you'll see there's a, there's a subdivision for new operators versus for existing operators. Um, if the scores are not satisfactory, then the operators uh, are guided towards different chapters of the book, and this is obviously just for indication at the moment, as the uh, the guide isn't complete at the moment. Um, and we've recommended, based on different scores, so based on the different numbers that come out of the score, whether whether the operation uh, might be classed as poor, fair to good, or excellent. Um, and I think from the feedback we've had so far, people have said that this is going to be a very useful uh, start point, both for existing and new operators. Lastly, on the uh, very practical side of things, I mentioned at the beginning that there are around 25 different species of sharks and rays um, that are the focus of shark and ray tourism operations at the moment, and undoubtedly that number uh, will grow over time, although we'll probably be limited to uh, you know, the more charismatic uh, larger species or species doing particularly interesting behavior. So the, there, there are examples given um, that are either taken or modified from existing codes of conduct. Um, this one here shows you the uh, Manta Trust interaction guidelines uh, for manta rays. Uh, we also uh, we have example codes of conduct from whale sharks, for basking sharks, uh, for general coastal and pelagic sharks, stingrays, manta and devil rays, um, and the particular case of um, shark cage diving. So in terms of where we are with the guide, uh, we are on the final stages um, of uh, finishing off the guide, um, we are looking to release it in mid-November, mid um, and I apologize that that's frustrating for anybody on the call who wants to get their hands on it straight away. Um, if you are interested in getting it hot off the press, uh, please do email our project manager, Anissa Lawrence, um, whose email is here and will also appear at the, uh, the end of the presentations. We are still in discussion about the, uh, the languages uh, that the guide will be translated into. Um, and our thinking at the moment is that at least uh, we would want to do Spanish and Bahasa um, Indonesian. Indonesian. We are uh, uh, planning a series of uh, training workshops, I and mean, clearly getting the guide out um, is just, uh, in many ways, is the, is the, is the easier aspect. And obviously, we're hopeful that, um, uh, that this will be taken up as something of a, something of a standard uh, for the industry. Um, and at this point in time, we're tentatively planning training workshops in the Greater Caribbean, Coral Triangle, um, South Pacific, and Galapagos. Um, we have <clears throat> no dates um, and specifics planned. These are yet uh, all our efforts really on completing the guide at the moment. Um, but we we do hope that we'll be able to start conducting training um, perhaps in uh, in December uh, at the earliest this year. Lastly, from me, I'd just like to thank. Um, our financial sponsors of the project, including Project Aware, to the Netherlands and Germany, the Paddy Foundation, uh, and the Swiss Foundation. Um, <laughs> I can't do justice here to the, the technical aided industry advisors that we have as a group, but um, we will certainly be, uh, be thanking them um, in the guide itself. Thank you.
Thank you, Andy. Um, I just wanted to welcome everybody again, for those of you who've just joined us. Uh, my name is Carol Poo. I'm manager of the MPA Action Agenda. Uh, we have jointly organized this webinar with MPA News and EBM Tool Network. Sarah Carr from MPA News and EBM Tool Network is also online today. Um, which is coordinated by NatureServe and Open Channels. Um, we've just had a presentation by Andy Cornish, um, and he will now um, answer some questions. Um, if you have any more questions, just um, write your questions down in the chat questions chat box, and I'll put them forward to Andy. Thanks for the presentation, Andy. I've got a question here from Andrea Delapa, and her question is. Has there been any evaluation or recommendations about potential changes in areas or sites commonly used by sharks due to impacts of climate change? She's curious about the future potential changes in shark um, presence or absence in certain areas and how to approach the management issue through, I guess, a more dynamic approach. How do we address climate change and um, in terms of the, the, the shift in uh, where we find uh, a lot of these species? Thank you. That's a, an interesting question, uh, to put it mildly. Um, the simple answer is that the guide itself doesn't provide specific advice on changes that might occur under climate change. Um, my general understanding, uh, there, are, there, are certain, there are a few papers out there now that, um, that do look into uh, potential impacts uh, on different species and different, different kinds of species. Um, I, my understanding is that that would not be that that, that science is not anywhere near um, advanced enough to be able, to be likely to be able to predict impacts to um, you know to, to localized habitats. Um, but I guess essentially that this comes down to the need to uh, to be continually um, conducting research. You know whether it's um, you know potentially the operators themselves, but perhaps more likely uh, in combination with um, NGOs or academics. I and mean, I think it's only really by, you know, monitoring the habitat itself and you know basic variables such as uh, sea, you know, uh, water temperature, you know, and act actually monitoring, you know, the numbers of animals and behaviour of animals over time, uh, you'd actually be able to start to pick up changes that might be climate change related, um, and then, um, you know, depending on the specifics, um, build those into um, build them into a response. Thanks for that, Andy. I've got another question here from Megan Jeans. Has there been any consideration uh, in terms of developing a professional network or information sharing platform for existing or prospective operators to discuss and share best practices um, and also lessons learned across and within the different regions? We are in, um, we have discussed this among, in, our, in our steering committee, uh, the best practice sharing. Um, the simple answer to that at the moment is that we are still discussing uh, whether or not this might be something that is best taken up by our organizations um, or might be best taken up by uh, you know there are there are other people out there um, who are uh, active in this uh, the space of shark and ray tourism and possibly um, an existing platform um, might be you know might be as good as something that, uh, that we could offer um, in terms of uh, an expert uh, network of practitioners, absolutely. We are very much looking through these training workshops um, to build up a network of practitioners that goes far beyond um, our organizations. You know, there are a lot of very passionate, knowledgeable people out there, um, and we would hope that we would uh, start to build a network um, from those workshops. So very much yes to the latter question. Thanks, Andy. I've got um, two questions up already. Um, I've got a question here from Eva Di Donata. Uh, where will where will the Greater Caribbean um, training uh, be held? Do we have any information on that, Andy? We don't at the moment. And uh, hello, Eva. E Eva and I, just for everybody else's uh, interest, Eva and I worked together in 2001, 2002 in American summer. We haven't, we've had very little contact with each other, so it's very, very nice, nice to uh, hear that name. Um, we are in early stages of planning, and I'm afraid we haven't even, we haven't even narrowed it down to, uh, to a potential country yet. So, sorry, not a very satisfactory answer, but we are, we are well aware this is something we need to get cracking on. 
Um, I would suggest, um, Annie, maybe you can get in touch with Eva to follow up on that. Um, and I have another question here from Noreen Najmi Spears. Um, is there any quantifiable amount of tourists that should be considered as too much before the animals get too stressed out? The, the less than satisfying answer to that, I think, is it depends. Um, it really depends on many things, in, you know, including the, uh, the species in question. You know, different species have different tolerances um, to interactions with people, and you know, very much the uh, the kind of the, the the interaction method, whether it's people snorkeling um, or diving. So, the we do provide um, differing advice based on different species. Um, based on the uh, the adapted code of conducts um, that appear in the last um, the last tool that I mentioned. Thanks for that, Andy. So perhaps we'll move on to the next presenter. Um, I'm just going to make you the presenter, Isabel, so that you'll be able to share your screen. And while you're doing that, I'll just introduce everybody to Isabel Ender. Isabel Ender leads Mantis Trust's participation in this project. She's the Mantis Trust Head of Conservation Strategy and a marine biologist by training. Her role includes supporting Manta and Mobula research across the Mantis Trust network, which covers more than 20 countries, working towards international protective legislation for the species, establishing and maintaining collaborations, uh, conducting public outreach, as well as, a, as driving implementation of a global devil and manta ray conservation strategy. Isabel is also a keen diver and based in Australia. Are you ready to go, Isabel? Yes, I am. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you perfectly. Just as you're starting, I'd like to remind everybody to write their questions down in the questions box, and we'll take them up during the Q&A. Okay, thank yours, you Isabel. very much. Thank you. Isabel, we so, aren't seeing your um, presentation, though. I'm sorry? Oh, we aren't seeing your presentation. You are uh, not. Is everyone else? No, can you can you transfer the presenter to um, Isabel, please? I already have. Um... Let me try it again. And did you you hit share your screen? Waiting to view Isabel and their screen. It says, "Do you want to put up the PowerPoint?" And, and then um, it should there should be something that pops up saying, "Are you willing to share your screen?" Yeah, and I clicked that already. Um, why don't you take the presenter off yeah. and then send it to me again? We'll just give it another go. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, I just switched to that. Yep, now I see your screen. Okay. Working. Okay, Thank so you. If I do this on to here, I will have to move this to the side and you can see Oops. My slides. Can you see the slide all fine now? Perfect. Yep. Case yep. studies. I don't yep. actually know how to take this off on the side, so we'll just have to do it. So thank you everybody for your patience. And um, I'm very excited to be on this webinar and to be part of this uh, project, which like Andy mentioned, has been quite a big project in the making. So we started discussing um, this more than a year ago already. Um, and I will be presenting in the second part of, this, of the webinar the case studies that we have looked at um, in more detail to get a better understanding of how uh, of the different approaches that uh, people have taken to managing shark and ray tourism. So we have chosen case studies that um, were examples with MPAs um, and shark and ray tourism, and that also showed some innovative financing of their management. So it doesn't mean that every aspect of the dive operation in these case studies are showing best practice. We didn't look at that. We focused on selecting case studies based on the above criteria. So our first case study is Monad Show in the Philippines, where the dive operators have formed a fund to protect the, this Russia shark site. The Philippines is in the Coral Triangle, and Monad Show is a place near Malapasco, which is a small island just north of Cebu, and it's known because it is uh, the only location where there is a predictable chance um, to see Russia sharks when you go diving. 
At the moment, there's over 10 dive centers using this site, as well as liverboards. And because um, the diving always happens early in the morning, because that's when the thrushes rise up from the deep and uh, come to the cleaning station, it's not uncommon to have up to 50 people in the water at the same time. In 2002, Monarchil, which is down here on the right, was established um, as an MPA. And in 2015, Monash Shoal down here, as well as Gato Island over on the top left, this whole area was designated as Philippines' first shark and ray sanctuary, which means that it prohibits catching, possession, and trading of shark and ray species. The way this MPA is financed, because obviously that is one of the things we're very interested in uh, to learn, is it is a municipality MPA. So the government collects a three US dollars per person to enter the site. Um, the use of this money is, is unclear to some extent and enforcement by the government has been uh, considered weak. So in 2010, the dive centers of Malapascua joined forces and established the Malapascua Marine Protection Fund, which means they are now um, collecting an additional dollar per diver and um, in 2015 that amounted to about 21,000 US dollars. With this extra revenue generated from the MMPF, they have trained 28 ex-fishermen as sea patrols to enforce fishing regulations um, within this MPA, as well as provided three patrol vessels and one more vessel was provided by Cebu in 2015. And since then, the incidence of illegal fishing have greatly decreased. However, we can learn that from this case study, there's also some challenges that have arisen. So the introduction of um, enforcement of the MPA through this MMPF was done without much consultation with the fishing community. So obviously that has created uh, a certain extent of tension between those stakeholders. And only about half of the dive centers routinely collect fees for the MMPF, but they're all benefiting from the um, patrolling and, and enforcement. It is also unclear the degree to which this no-take MPA really conserves this thresh shark population because obviously thresh sharks move around, they don't just stay within this protected area. And uh, finally, there is a need for greater transparency of the use of the MPA fees. So those were the things that, and a little bit of a profile from the first case study we looked at. To dig a little bit deeper, we've looked at a second case study, which is very close to my heart. Um, it's Hanifar Bay uh, battle in the Maldives, where scientists, tourism operators, and governments have united. Maldives is located in the Indian Ocean. And to give you a bit of a background, so Hanifar Bay is in battle, which is in the northeast of the Maldives, and it has a very unique shape, like a funnel. And uh, during the southwest monsoon, or May to December, the plankton is being pushed into this funnel, uh, into this bay, um, and it's starting to collect it because it cannot go anywhere else. So this um, has attracted large seasonal aggregations of manta rays and whale sharks because they come there to feast on the plankton. Over here you can see Hanifaru Bay, this funnel-shaped bay over here. And in 2009, Hanifaru was declared a marine protected area. And in 2011, the entire Bato was declared a UNESCO heritage area, with Hanifaru being a core zone. Now the way this MPA is financed is uh, there is a visitor fee collected per person of 20 US dollars and this goes directly to the Battle Conservation Fund. Now this fund includes a range of stakeholders uh, from fishermen, scientists, resorts um, and councillors from the Battle. and this fund is in charge of managing the operations of this reserve. A certain percentage of the revenue that's coming from those visitor fees is dedicated towards enforcement and um, this is so to say outsourced to the Ministry of Environment so the money goes back to the Environmental Protection Agency to the government um, to do the patrolling of the site and I've got a video to show you on the next slide just to see what it looks like at the moment in terms of the strict interactions
So there's a set number of people that are allowed to swim with the manta rays and regulations on how the people can be in the water and how to approach the manta rays. So it's a really nice way to see how um, a tourism can be managed in a nice and controlled way. But it also has its challenges. Um, so particularly at the beginning when the MPA was established, patrol and enforcement at Hanifar Bay was um, a bit of an issue because um, the patrols were supposed to be there every day, but they weren't necessarily, and they weren't necessarily checking on the permits with everybody. But that has improved a lot over the last two, three years. Um, also, alternate access days were introduced so that one day was open for the operators to go to Hanifar Bay the next next day the liverboards were allowed. But obviously with liverboards being on a very strict schedule, that meant that even though sometimes the manta rays were there and the liverboards were there, they weren't allowed to go. So that was a bit tricky for the liverboards. Um, and finally, the permits had to be purchased at the capital island of the Bartol, which is a fair ride away from some of the resort islands. And so if some manta rays were at Honey for a Bay, um, but the operators didn't have enough tokens, enough permits for all their guests. That just meant that the guests weren't allowed to go because uh, operators couldn't buy permits. So our final case study um, comes from Fiji. It's the Shark Reef National Marine Park in Fiji, where a coastal community benefits directly from shark tourism. We're back to the sharks now, and we're over in the Pacific Ocean now. This is Fiji. And Shark Reef is known particularly for its close encounters with up to seven species of sharks. But the main attraction is the large number of adult bull sharks that you can see there. Shark Reef, which you see over here, this square, was declared Fiji's first fully protected national marine park in 2014. Although preparations to get this established started well before that. And the physical interaction with the reef is limited to an area less than 2% of the entire reef. There's strictly controlled diving and no fishing. To give you a bit more of a background, so in 2003, Baker Adventure Divers, one of the dive operators, uh, started talking with two of the communities. Um, and eventually they reached an agreement where the communities voluntarily relinquished their indigenous fishing rights, known as Koli Koli at Shark Reef, granting back adventure divers operation exclusive access. And so in return, the divers um, are charged a fee for entering the park together with back adventure divers, and this fee is donated directly to the communities. More recently, all five communities in the area have declared a prohibition on shark fishing throughout the entire Koli Koli, creating a 30 kilometer stretch of protected water known as the Fiji Shark Corridor. So that's this corridor over here, looking back onto our map. That whole area is now protected. Now the way this MPA is financed, um, it's um, Baker Adventure divers who are charging a fee of approximately 12 US dollars. Um, it's 25 Fijian dollars per day per person entry to this marine park. And 100% of that goes to the communities. And they're able to um, accumulate about 100,000 US dollars a year just from these funds. This money is used to um, train, oh, sorry, Big Adventure Divers are also training and employing some local community members in the dive operation. So for example, one uh, local community, uh, one person from the local community is trained to become a paddy dive master every year. And together with the Department of Fisheries, they train all their staff as well as local fishermen as fish wardens to monitor activities. And fish wardens have the power to act as representatives of the Department of Fisheries. And if they see any illegal activities and um, report it, the law enforcement agencies are obliged to follow that through. And so this public-private partnership really reduces the, the financial burden of monitoring of the, to the government. And the money raised uh, from the entrance fee has been used for things such as construction, maintenance, infrastructure, education, and bereavement payments. But this case, case study also shows us some challenges that can occur. So at the moment, there's no legal recourse to formalize levy payments in Fijian law. There's obviously the threat of a decline in local shark populations and large predatory fish, which could translate into less tourists coming to the site and therefore less revenue generated. 
And obviously, relinquishing of fishing rights can only be done with community consent. So it's up to the community to decide whether they want to enter into this kind of agreement or not. And finally, there has been an increase in Fiji's dive operation offering shark experiences. Um, however, that doesn't uh, guarantee that it's, they're being following a similar model of sustainability and community benefits. So we're looking at those three case studies in a little bit more detail to, to get a better understanding of sort of, I guess, the practical way of the guide and the background of, um, of why we approach this as well. We can see that there are certainly some similarities and some differences just in those three case studies. Um, often there is a community-led fund that complements government regulations and uh, the fees from, from the tourism uh, yeah, used directly for management and enforcement. However, that mostly is when when it is led by the community by the community fund. Um, there are, however, some differences we can see as well. For example, regarding the range of stakeholders that are included in the community-led initiatives, so how diverse that set is, and also in terms of the communication between government and community-led work. So, is um, are they closely working together and communicating well, or is it too almost separate entities that are working here. And finally, the, the model of Fiji's example seems suited to small MPAs with limited stakeholders and whether the local communities have the fishing rights under the law. But it is questionable how this could work in another scenario. Um, it is becoming clear though that proactive dive operators really can initiate conservation action, can really make a difference, and uh, that the government collected visitor fees should be used for the MPA management. However, it really is important that they are advised by a diverse set of stakeholder committee um, in the process. So coming to the end of not just my presentation, also to summarize a little bit what we've talked about today, um, Andy has introduced the guide to you all. Um, and he has mentioned that our main target audience is the dive community, new and existing, as well as other stakeholders such as community groups, NGOs, and authorities. We've gone through what to consider when you're a new operation wanting to start um, a shark and ray tourism operation, and also how to choose a site looking at different codes of conduct and compliance. We've looked at uh, how to manage and monitor impacts. So there is um, guidance in, uh, in the guide <laughs> on this kind of issue. And also looked at the issue of collaboration and how important that is and how you can do it and how you can approach that. And then we've looked at three case studies just to illustrate a bit more um, vividly what, what we're talking about here. And Andy has mentioned that at this uh, second part of the guide is uh, the best practice toolkit that we're developing together with uh, our fantastic scientific advisors and our industry experts, um, which includes a self-assessment, a checklist, a scorecard, and a code of conduct. So there's some resources that are online already. The fact sheets um, on two of these case studies are online under the MPA Action website and on the Manta Trust website. Um, the Fiji one is being updated because there have been some recent changes, so we just want to make sure everything is completely up to date. That's being uploaded very soon. And as Andy mentioned, the guide will be available in mid-November. And if you want an electronic version, um, please email the project manager, or at some point later on you will be able to download it from our website. And that takes me to the end of my part of this presentation and any questions you might have. Thank you Thank very you much. Very much. Thank you, Isabel, for that great presentation. Um, I'm going to open up the floor again for questions. I have a couple of questions already. So there's one question still for, for Andy. And Isabel, you can jump in to, uh, to answer it as well. Um, mm -hmm. Andy, are you back online? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Yes. So the question comes from Malou uh, Van Kampen. And her question is, could you maybe tell us a little bit more about the monitoring of the practices? Um, and for example, how is the public sector addressed? And who is actually going to be doing the monitoring on how these uh, best practices are being applied? Well, thank you. So um, if I understand the question correctly, um, 
there is uh, possibly an, an assumption that we are setting up some kind of um, <clears throat> a certification scheme or at least um, some way that uh, operators who are who are using the best practice guide thoroughly um, could be recognized. So that is actually a, a step further uh, than we're planning at the moment. Um, this really at the moment this is really all about providing uh, filling a vacuum for, uh, for advising shark and rake tourism operations you know of all shapes and sizes uh, that may have no single place to turn. Um, it is possible further down the line that if there is sufficient interest um, that this might move into uh, the kind of scheme um, you know where perhaps there are lists of uh, operators that are that are using it um, and perhaps um, you know if that was the case then there would need to be um, occasional checks um, on that just to make sure that things were in balance um, at the moment we are not planning to take it to that stage as I said this is this is just getting some voluntary guidance out there, for, uh, there at this stage and we'll, uh, we'll see how the how the guidance is, is received if I if I didn't understand your question if I misinterpreted please do um, uh, type it again and I'll, uh, I'll have you have you have another go Hello. <laughs> I had it on mute. Uh, I, I right. had it on... <laughs> thanks for that. So I will start again. So thanks for that, Andy. Um, I have a question here from William Michaels. His question is, um, for either presenters, is there guidance for helping business owners to develop their socioeconomic case that a live shark is more valuable than a harvested shark? And where is this information? Um, where, and where is this information? And and it needs to be presented, for example, to regional fisheries councils and so forth. Is is this kind of information available readily for people? Um, I can, Andy, if you want, I can start <laughs> answering this question, and then if there is something you want to say, maybe you can follow up on that as well. Um, the way I understand this question is that. It, it, <laughs> Per se, in the guide, there is no specific prescription on how you can make your case that uh, shark tourism and, and a live shark is more worth than a dead shark. But there are a lot of studies out there um, that show that, and um, we do have a, a quite an extensive reference list um, as part of the guide. So there's obviously materials to read up on this, but um, the guide itself is does provide some advice on how to start approaching the the local stakeholders in terms of um, getting the buy-in and getting the what they, what is called the social license to operate there so there are there is some advice on how to start getting acceptance and um, the buy-in from the all the stakeholders that are relevant to a particular case but there's nothing specifically that says this is what you would have to do to make your case that a live shark is, you know, is, is more valuable than a dead, and that is why um, tourism should be encouraged. Yeah, just, Thank just, you, just, very, just, just very quickly on that. I mean, we have had that uh, feedback from some stakeholders. You know, and this is one of the things. Obviously, you know, the, you know, people, people always think about uh, additional information that, you, that could be in the guide, and we really struggle to try and keep it concise, um, but contain at least all the basic information. So, on that particular topic, because the the situations and the, the things that authorities will respond to, you know, and even local communities will be very different from different from different place, and that approach won't always work. So, as Isabel said. Uh, um, what we will do in the guide is we will provide an up-to-date date list of the references um, where those kind of studies have been done um, and then it should be at least fairly straightforward for people to pick out the information that's most useful to their circumstance. Thanks Andy. Um, another question, maybe this one's for Isabel maybe. Um, has there been a, from a question from Chiara um, to Carino Crow and her question is, has there been any investigation as to why only half the dive centers um, on uh, Malapascua uh, actually collect the MMPF fees? 
I believe um, that it is vol a voluntary thing to do and there's actually there are for example some local businesses and some restaurants that are also collecting fees for this um, because it is not something that is a, a mandatory thing um, it is something that is voluntary and it is up to the operation um, themselves whether they want to do that or not um, as far as I um, have known from the research we have done um, it is basically that consultations have taken place and uh, people have reached out but it is really up to the operator to you know to to start taking action as well themselves so that's what it comes down to at the moment because it's a voluntary thing thank you isabel we're we're receiving a lot of questions so we'll do our best to pose them all um, to <laughs> isabel at the end <laughs> so uh, more I to have <laughs> Um, so I have a question from Karen Apps. Does the guide include comprehensive recommendations for on-tour education and interpretation, including training for operators and their staff? Can you repeat that again? Question, the first bit. Yeah, I will. I will. I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand it myself <laughs> as I'm reading it. So Karen, I'm. I'm sorry if I. Uh, if I'm missing something here, but the question is: Does the guide include comprehensive recommendations? for on-tour education and interpretation, including training for operators and their staff, I guess in terms of um, providing information during uh, tours. Does, does it have any guidance on that? So the guide does mention um, basic recommendations in terms of uh, the there should be, for example, a briefing before um, before the interaction. What should be, um, you know, to some extent, what should be part of the briefing, and also um, some recommendations in terms of um, ongoing education for the staff and uh, for the operation itself. Um, but it doesn't. It is very hard to say that as a general thing when we're looking at, a, at such a range of species and situations um, and, and locations as well. Um, so for that, we, we have to keep it quite general in terms of um, the recommendations that, that we're making to that respect. And again, um, there, will be, um, there will be those training workshops where obviously operators can learn more about this and also again the guide has a lot of reference links and documents for learning more about different sections um, it has links of that in there as well so there is plenty of resources for learning and for um, sort of further education in that sort of way but not something that you know again is formally prescribed by the guide Thank you, Isabel. I have a question from Richard Rees um, for either of you. A general question. Um, is anyone on the panel or audience aware of a TripAdvisor equivalent for wildlife excursions through which operators could be rated based on some of the core principles you've outlined in the guide today, um, thus increasing the incentive for best practice? If I could just maybe um, just uh, provide an answer. Um, Richard, uh, one that I'm aware of is an initiative called Care for Destinations and what they're going to do is look at how we can as uh, tourists provide feedback on the sustainability of the operator or and also in terms of uh, what kind of food they provide and the kind of experiences they give uh, from a very uh, strong sustainability perspective that I don't think they're live yet so when they are live I, I, I'm, uh, I know that they're keen to do a presentation for us but I'll ask uh, I'll open up uh, the floor to Isabel or Andy do you, are you aware of any um, any system like TripAdvisor for wildlife excursions Yes, we, we are aware of that and we've also discussed it as part of, you know, where, where, where do we go next once the guy is launched and completed it, so to say. Um, so that was part of our considerations, um, where are we going? We're doing training, uh, you know, training events, um, but in terms of are we aiming to get some sort of certification system? No, not ourselves, because again, those things exist, like for example, the one that, that, that was just mentioned. So we are aware that, that there is these kind of um, rankings and feedback uh, through um, programs such as TripAdvisor. 
Um, but we haven't completely finalized uh, or, or made a decision on whether this guide should be linked to a particular um, sort of ranking system that is that exists already. So again, that is something that we're still um, looking at as a possibility or um, again something that might grow organically over time. Um, I don't know, Andy, if you want to add on to that. Um, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Great, thanks, Isabel. Um, I have a question here from um, Devanshi Kasana. For a multiple use area with existing operations beyond carrying capacity of the site, what is the ideal approach to scaling down operations without causing conflict? So I guess the question is to do with you know an area where there are a lot of uh, operators operating at the moment, then how do you scale down the pressure on the site without causing too much conflict? Um, so one of the examples, for example, was, was just now in, in one of the case studies, a way of scaling it down is giving alternate access days, for example. Um, there are some other um, examples out there where people have uh, put a, almost like a quota per operator or per user uh, on the permits to use it. So, so there are various examples out there, but um, I don't recall whether we're actually trying to list all of these options specifically in the guide. I, I believe, again, we've, you know, it is in there and there's resources there's links to where you can read up exactly more on, on what are the examples, what are the approaches people have taken. And again, it, it obviously varies depending on um, where, on the situation, on the local um, communities, on, um, you know, on, on a lot of factors, what approach you're finally going for. Um, so again, there's, there's links in our guide on where you can specifically read up on, on such questions. But we're not going into detail in the guide per se because we're trying to keep the guide as concise as we can. I think Thanks, if I, can I just just add to that briefly. I mean, there for many of the issues, you know, around shark and ray tourism, that the science isn't so precise for uh, different kinds of scenarios that you could <clears throat> um, be very predictive in advance. So. I mean, what, what we see out there at the moment is that, you know, many operations are homegrown, um, and in cases where there does seem to be overcrowding, it, it, it has often been, or at least from the ones that I'm familiar with, that, you know, an operator has started, or maybe several operators have started, and then other people have realized uh, that this is a good thing, um, and, you know, more and more operators are, are, you know, acting at the same site. So in a situation like that, um, you really need to be guided um, by the science of what the science is telling you in terms of the impacts uh, to the animals. Um, and there are basic uh, processes that, that are outlined in the guide for, you know, engaging, getting the major stakeholders engaged with the operators, uh, the communities, the, <clears throat> the local authorities, um, to work through issues like that. Um, and, uh, you know, this is, this is why continuous improvement is such an important part of the guide because you know very few cases people are going to get it, get it exactly right first time you really need to be monitoring the situation um, you know and there may, may well be sites that you know can take a lot more visitors uh, than there are at the moment but you need to you need to be monitoring the site be guided by the, by the research um, and hopefully from the start have a good understanding between the stakeholders which will make it much more diff much more easy to have those are uh, those more difficult discussions. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to start pulling some of the questions because we're almost running out of time. There's a lot of questions to do with NPAs, especially around um, limiting um, tourism activities within NPA. Um, you know, what would be? Uh, is there any case for doing that at all? From what you've seen in the best practices that keep, you know, having no-go areas within MPAs, is there a scientific basis for that? Um, and also, what can MPA managers do in terms of monitoring the impact of, um, of tourism on, on, on species? 
Should I pose a question again, Andy and Isabel? Well, there's quite a few questions there. Um, yeah, there's <laughs> a lot. Of them. Okay, so let's start with the first one. How do we deal with um, uh, um, effectively implementing MPAs when we have a, a huge interest, for example, within an MPA area for shark or and uh, ray tourism? Uh, what can what what do people need to do in terms of addressing the biodiversity uh, aspects of of M MPAs and managing MPAs while there's a huge tourism interest? How do people deal with that? Okay, I can I can answer that question. So I think. Um, when, when we were developing this guide, um, together with our advisors and, and the experts, we, we came up to that question and, and you have to make a choice. This guide, um, it, to what detail are we starting to go into MPA management and into um, actually that issue, which, which in itself is, is a very, very big topic. A lot of research has been done on, the, on how to manage MPAs, how to monitor MPAs. Um, so we are not trying to give advice on how to um, how to approach setting up an MPA or managing an MPA or monitoring an MPA. Um, we're giving advice to in terms of if you want to conduct tourism within an MPA or if, if you're conducting tourism and then an MPA gets established, um, you know, how to make sure that uh, you are monitoring your impact and you are trying to not negatively affect the environment and the animals. Um, having any negative impact, but um, the guide is not intended to give advice on, on MPA management per se. So that is, um, it was something that we have pulled into our case studies, um, but again, that, that's something that is a whole different topic um, that we cannot go into that much detail because again, then we would be making this guide very, very long. Andy, do you agree? Um, yes, essentially. I mean, there are there are there's so much in in terms of really trying to find a niche for this. Uh, we could have easily had a huge overlap with the big body of work that already exists out there on MPA management. Um, we wrestled with this, and in the end, we decided um, that we would really focus on the niche of shark and ray tourism. In terms of an effective MPA management, um, we would point to you know some of the some of the better um, bodies of work that are out there already. Um, I appreciate that that's not going to be um, a satisfactory answer for everybody on this call, um, but this was one of those hard decisions we had to make. Thanks for that, Andy. Um, there's a lot of questions in terms of how do we get the, the, the guide out there? How do you plan to socialize the guide um, you know, to communities and to dive operators? Is, are there any plans? How do you intend to spread the word on, about the guide besides this webinar? <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so I mean, it's Joanne on the call. Actually, Joanne will probably be the best person to answer this. We have we have a very detailed outreach strategy, but um, just wondering to what extent I, we want to go into that right now. <laughs> so I am Joanne. still on the call. Um, so it's Joanne from Project Aware here. So yeah, we're planning on, um, as Andy and Isabel have both said, launching the guide around mid-November, and we'll roll that out across our partner communication platforms as much as we can. So social web, online and offline outreach along with the assistance that we have from our technical advisory group and the industry association group that we've been bringing into. But Project Aware works a lot with many, many dive centers around the world and we have um, great connections there. So we'll be um, sending you know direct messages to them and then moving through kind of pilot workshops with the guides in a number of locations to kind of get more buy-in from the industry and then as Andy mentioned before um, looking at how we can develop this kind of like expert support network so that it's kind of it does become quite peer-to-peer -peer, um, and, and kind of community led and um, and instigated, really. Thank you, Joanne. Um, 
with that, uh, we will end today's webinar session. Um, we tried our best to answer all your questions. I realize there's a lot more questions that uh, that have not been answered. Um, just I would just encourage you all. There will be a se second webinar session on Thursday. You can register for that also via open channels. It'll be a, a chat session, so the presenters will be um, answering the questions directly as well. And of course, I would encourage you to get in touch with Isabel and with Andy. Um, we will share also the email addresses uh, uh, via open channels and mpaction.org. Um, I just want to thank Isabel and um, Andy for the presentation, and of course um, Sarah from EBM Tool Network and MPA News for organizing this uh, web webinar session with us, and of course all the participants for taking the time to join us on today's webinar. A live recording of the uh, webinar will be made available via openchannels.org and mpaaction.org, and also um, the PowerPoints will be made available uh, via the, the websites. I realize some of you had difficulty seeing the screen. And with that, we will end today's webinar session. Thank you very much.